So the technical focus of my talk is on how to build scalable virtual machine services. But in order to understand where we are, I want to give you a little bit of a history lesson. So if you look at the 20th century, looking back on uh, the hardware revolution, the, the processors got faster, clock speeds got faster, we added out of order issue, bigger caches, prefetching, all sorts of stuff. But it was all premised on the fact that programs don't really change, programs are all the same, they don't, the architects didn't have to think about the programs. Okay, and why was that? Well, because they put them in this sequential interface. They wrapped them up in the IA32 ISA, or something close, and they said, okay, as long as you obey this and use this interface, we can ignore the applications. And why was this a good mechanism? Because it encapsulated the complexity of the processor. So you don't have to rewrite your software every time Intel comes out with a new processor. Your software runs on this hardware. And so that's the nuance of the hardware. So what was happening on the software side is very similar. Programs were, and applications were getting larger and more capable. They were more, getting more complicated, harder to reason about. And people didn't want to think about the hardware, and they didn't. So how did they do that? They just think, oh, the hardware just runs faster. They wrap this in the sequential interface. And, uh, and, and, and so as long as they're obeying that, they can deal with whatever the hardware is giving us. All right? So that didn't quite solve all our problems, though. So we were using native languages, but they weren't up to the task of really complicated, large pieces of software. We needed modularization, and, and people voted with their feet and moved to managed programming languages in order to uh, manage software complexity. So you could reason about uh, subsystems of a large application in isolation of the entire application. You didn't have to chase a C pointer bug in, uh, in one part of the system that was caused by another part of the system. All right? And so what did we get? Well, we got some good and some bad languages out of that. JavaScript, I'd say, try to kill it as much as you can. But right now, on the Toby indicator of what are the most popular programming languages, Java's winning. We also have a lot of C Sharp, and we have a lot of these dynamic scripting languages do seem to be solving the problem that programmers are having. PHP and JavaScript are still growing in popularity. All right? So that sequential interface hid a bunch of complexity for everybody. And it, what it let us create was a virtuous cycle in which the hardware could get faster and the software didn't have to change, but it got the benefit of the faster hardware and the software could be built in anticipation of the hardware getting faster. So the hardware wasn't, what, wasn't quite enough, fast enough to make your, your uh, application do what you wanted. Well, you could just wait a year and then, and then it would be fast enough. So people didn't have to adjust very, uh, very much. But all this is premised on the sequential interface. Unfortunately, that's not exactly what's happened since the 20th first century got started. So in 2004, IBM introduces the first multi-core computer, and since then all we've had uh, in desktop and laptop and soon to be on your cell phone is multi-process computers. So if you've been paying attention at all, you know why this is happening, so I'm not going to go into the details of that. But what does that destroy? Well, that destroys the contract between the software and the hardware. And so now we have a new interface. We have a parallel interface. And it's not at all clear that we can create this ecosystem where ever more capable applications and ever more capable hardware drives technology innovation so that we can build just a whole lot better applications, a whole lot better hardware. And we can drive this engine of the economic computer economics that's been going on, all right? So let's look. So this has been going on for six years, right? Let's look, how are we doing? How's this new virtuous cycle going? All right, so what I'm gonna show you now are some measured power versus performance numbers for a bunch of applications you've heard about, all right? So here 
what we've done is uh, for processor generation starting in 2003, which this is uh, uh, a Pentium 4 single, pro single, single CPU, and these are benchmarks are the spec CPU, so I've got data <coughs> benchmarks in there, Decapo Java benchmarks, and the spec JVM benchmarks. And oops, I'm missing one. I also have in here the the Parsec benchmarks, which are C kernels of parallel applications put together by some people at Intel and at Princeton. All right. So this has a mix of sequential and parallel workloads. It has a mix of native workloads and of managed workloads. Okay. Any, any scripting workloads? No scripting workloads because this was hard enough and time consuming enough sure, to measure. Sure. All right, but it would be interesting to add those and and uh, and I think I think that Decapo Java is representative of what you'd see in many of those except they have more parallelism than most scripting languages are letting you. Like if you didn't know, let me be the first <coughs> to tell you, JavaScript has no parallelism constructs in it, not a single one. So you're not getting any parallelism from the application itself. You're only getting parallelism with JavaScript if you run multiple different distinct programs, which are obviously concurrent with each other and not interacting. All right? So this, what we measure here is on-chip power. So we have a Hall sensor, which basically measures the, the DC power, not AC. And you've got to attach it exactly at the right place at all these chips. And uh, Steve Blackburn's graduate student, Yang Shi, did all that work. And some machines, it didn't take very long, and you did it the same. And some machines, it took like a week or two to figure out exactly where to put it. And then we did measurements on micro benchmarks to make sure we were getting reasonable measurements. So we take measurements, and we average power that's consumed by these benchmarks. And we measure their speed up relative to uh, this processor, okay? Oh, sorry, relative to an atom in terms of its uh, speed up, a single core, and then also this is just direct power in a log scale and speed up in a log scale, all right? So to even understand this graph, it takes me five minutes to explain it. Are there any questions on what the axes are before I try to help you interpret the data? So David? the, the the square dots are for an i5, if I understand the legend, or a Pentium? This is the Pentium. This is 130 nanometer, the 2003. That's where we're starting. Okay. All right? It's so now we're going to watch what happens as we move forward over the past six years. Well, it's using five times. OK. And it's not relative to atom. Those are absolute watts there. These are absolute watts, but speed up is relative, relative to atom. Thank you, okay? Catherine. So you're, you speed up over an atom, which was built like three years ago in a more simpler uh, ideal, a simple, trying to make the technology a little simpler, it's an in-order core, right? But it's built in, uh, in 65 nanometer. Is this a 65 nanometer or a 45 nanometer 45. technology? I've got that on the last slide. It's one of those. It's okay, though. it's okay. All right, I, I think it. it's 65. Yeah, the 230 is 65. Got okay? <clears throat> All right, so that's where we started in 2003 seven years. All right, so we skip a generation because of that's what we had in our lab, and we get to 2006, where we get the Core 2 Duo, all right? So it has two processors. It's basically halved the size of the, tra the transistor got smaller, so it's built in a smaller technology. And how do we do in using those chips? Well, hey, we got both power reductions, which was what Moore's law was promising us was power reductions together with performance improvements. Okay? So we're on target. We look good. All right? Then the next year, are we going to get to keep following this trend? No, we're not. So we basically, in 2008, we hit the power wall where you could either start burning more power for these applications and get some performance improvement, or you could die shrink and reduce the power consumption, but not get much performance improvement, all right? So instead of 
going like this, we either had to go up here to get more performance, or we had, if we wanted to go down here on the power scale, we had to give up performance. All right? And so it's not coming, it's came and went. All right? I'm sorry, they both look like triangles from back here. Which, which one is the I-7, which is the core two? The I-7 are the green triangles, and the purple triangles up here are, sorry, the purple triangles is, are the I-7, and the green triangles are the die shrink of the core two duos. Thank you. Okay? All right, so this is a pretty simple microarchitectural change. Not many changes, but there were more than I have time to discuss. And this is a different family of processors, right? So lots of smart engineers at Intel doing the best they can, and this is what they can do for us, all right? And then if we look at what happened next, well, we took that and we brought its power down and we got a little more performance, but this was over four years, right? Who were able to see squeeze out there a little, all right? So that's the bad news, all right? So maybe though, we're doing okay on the parallel applications, or we're doing okay on the sequential applications, and this is just because we've mixed those workloads together, okay? So in the sequential applications for managed languages is what I'm gonna show you next, all right? So, do you think this new hardware is helping sequential Java programs? No? A little bit. A little bit? <laughs> Good answer. Andy? Depends on, well, is your application using a single thread? I'm just going to show you single threaded Java very, applications. Okay, so but the VM has other threads, right? That's right. And so the V, very good answer. You get an A plus, you wanna to come to my class? <laughs> so, so this shows you performance scaling of the sequential Java benchmarks in our suite. So these are pulled mostly from uh, spec JVM, but some are also from Decapo. So there's some larger, more realistic benchmarks in here, all right? And then this is hardware context on the i7. So two by one means two real CPUs, one by two means one real C CPU with SMT, which is a hardware context on this machine, okay? So when this is four by one and this is four by two. All right, so if you thought SMT was gonna help you, you can be right a little bit, but the interference and the oversubscription of the resources means that you don't do as well as if you give two, hardware, two complete hardware contexts. And, and where is that performance improvement coming from? It's coming from parallel VM services. So the GC is parallel. The JIT, in some cases, can be run on that other processor. All right? 